You're tuned to the wavelength of your own beauty. It's your host, Ahmed Yunus, and this is The Step. Awesome. Munira Lekovic Azidin. Okay, so here's the thing. Can I do like an intro, a real intro? Why? <laughs> because I have to, because it's my show and I have to. Okay, okay. Keep it short. Munira. See, exactly. You just, that's it. There you go. Right there. You just gave it. Munira, easily, um, you know, in life, our parents, the parents of children who move around the world a lot tell us, take the good and leave the bad. And without any question, you are the person in my life that I've seen that has done that the best. You've lived, you are daughter of San Diego, um, lived in Egypt, lived in the United Arab Emirates, uh, UCLA. At UCLA, you had like an awakening, if you will, as a young person towards ethics, towards ideas, towards like the complexity of the relationship between the spiritual world and the physical world. Uh, you have a sister who became kind of a, a you know, a, a professional Muslim. She's really, really good at being a journalist, at communicating the ideas that we all hold so dear. You married a man who, um, without any exaggeration, I think every human that knows him would agree, is a person of prophetic character, is a person of the straight path, kindness, service to community. Um, and at the time that you married him, despite being the person that says, keep it short, Ahmed, he was Joe Bruin. Yes. He was the mascot of UCLA. And you easily, one of the most serious people I know, fell in love with the mascot at UCLA in the midst of the spiritual. Okay, fast forward. <laughs> You become the mother of these three lions. Your oldest, Yusuf, is uh, adept at human engagement, uh, loves who he is, fully actualizing his identity as a young person. Your middle son, uh, Zaid, a filmmaker, uh, has made you a, a mother of a Chapman Panther award winner in his craft. Um, Ali, your youngest, uh, the, the kind of the most beautiful character, free and open to the world, uh, ask questions without inhibition, etc. Once upon a time, you decided, I'm going to take these kids back to where my parents come from. Okay. So that was last summer, actually. Um, SubhanAllah, how the world has changed, right? In like Amazing. a year. Um, yeah, you know, we've been so blessed to travel so many places. And that was, that was intentional. I think for me and Ahmed, it was like, we want these kids to see the world and we want them to see different experiences. Um, and it was, it's kind of funny that, you know, they've been to Egypt um, a couple of times, in, you know, in the last like uh, seven years. Um, and last summer was kind of the summer of like, okay, we need to kind of see my side of the family too, right? And mm. kind of understand, you know, these other grandparents. Um, and so it was surreal because I hadn't been back for like 20 years. So okay, where and, is back? Oh, okay. Sorry. Yes. Um, context, because that's always what's so interesting. People are like, where is this country that you're from? So um, my family is from this really small country um, called, Montenegro. It's called Montenegro. I just want to make very clear yes. that I, you are not bothered. I want to make, I'm not one of the Muslims that thinks, okay, very good. Keep going. Right. Yes. So I'm from the small country called Montenegro and it's situated between Croatia, Bosnia and Albania, right? In, mm. Right there in Serbia. So it's like right there um, along the sea. And um, there's really, the, the Muslim population I think in Montenegro is only like 25%, right? Mm. So, um, it and was, the rest is what Munira Orthodox Christian, yes, Orthodox Christian, Catholic. Um, so yeah, it's it, it's very multicultural, right? The former Yugoslavia is very mm. multi ethnic, multi or not multi ethnic, multi religious, right? So, mm. um, that context is just part of our DNA, right? That's just oh, that's great. I mean, that's just 
that's how we were, you know, like that's all we know. Right. And so I think that was what was so beautiful for me to take the kids there because we've been to the Arab world. Right. And we've been to other Western countries and for them to kind of sit with that interesting context where it's like it is and it isn't, and it's just all mixed together. Um, and so we started our journey in Croatia because it's just so beautiful. And we were like, let's start this off vacation. Um, and, and then we took them over to Sarajevo. And this was actually my first time to go to Sarajevo. And wow. it, was, it was an incredible experience because we actually did like an actual tour. And we heard like the tour guy was beautiful because he gave the history of the area, right? And explained like, this is where this happened. And this is, you know, like historically, like where, you know, this president was shot, you know, and things like that. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just in awe while I was there because I'm walking through this like old town in Sarajevo and like, you see like a Nakabi walk by, right? And I'm thinking, oh, okay, that's different. Like even for me, like that is culturally not something I have ever seen in our region, right? right. And that's a new kind of thing that's kind of coming up in the region, right? And I'm thinking, no, they must be foreigners, right? Like even my own, you know, bias of, oh, they can't be. They're from the Gulf, they're on vacation. They're from the Gulf, right? They weren't Ahmed. I, like, I heard them speaking and they're wow. speaking our language. And I'm like, wow. wow. Like, so even the region, it, it's so interesting. Like I, you know, and I, I don't know, you know, like, but I think religion is important there. And I think people are trying to navigate it in their own way. Um, it, mm. So that was just so interesting. Just that experience. S tell us the story, if you would, I'm sorry to like yeah. re-inflict trauma. Just tell us the story of, the genocide. Um, it's like 1992, three, four. Right, right. Yeah. And the um, Serbian Orthodox Church is blessing physically soldiers as they embark upon what is an intentional removal of a people in whole or in mass, the definition of a genocide right. in international right. law. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about, about, I'm sorry to do this, but I think a I lot of people who are not our age don't really understand um, the Bosnian genocide. Yeah, I mean, you know, I was in high school, I believe, during that time. And that's, that's what's so interesting, Ahmed. Like, you know, we'll, like, we'll get into kind of my identity formation, especially mm -hmm. in the U.S., because we moved to the U.S. when I was two, right? So as a you know Balkan Muslim what that means and how I kind of had to understand what is going on there you know mm. and why are these Muslims getting killed like so I mean the, the genocide I mean the the fighting everybody's always like what is this fighting about why, why are they you know what what is this ethnic conflict um, and I think it, it came down to this identity issue of like are you really you know a Serb or a Croat or a Bosnian, right? And ethnically, they've separated out that from being a Muslim. I.e., if you're a Muslim, you're a foreigner here, you know? And so it became mm. this, even though for, for generations, people were intermarrying, right? Like, we, we had no issues, you know, for many years where people were just like, you know, we have one parent that's Muslim, one parent that's, you know, Orthodox or Catholic, or that's just was co like common there. Mm -hmm. So at that time, that friction became an us versus them, right? And so everybody went in their corners, and that's where this fighting and conflict happened. The genocide was so appalling because that was the time that we had the peacekeepers there, right? And they the were UN supposedly the UN peacekeepers, and they were supposedly protecting these people. Mm -hmm. And what ended up happening was that they couldn't, right? And so there was a mass slaughter of. Um, what is it, 6,000, 8,000 mm -hmm. men and boys who were, you know, eliminated and killed. Mm -hmm. and, the, and now what I think is so painful is that there is a denial of that genocide. So mm -hmm. when I think about what the Bosnian people have gone through and how they are trying to reclaim that narrative and say, you can't just erase that this happened and say, no, 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 that was just, that was, that was war. You know, both that, sides, you know, everybody did something sides. bad. Yeah, right, no, of right. course not. Um, and so I think that's like, like I said, when I was there and I'm, you know, traveling and visiting these people, the resilience, Ahmed, mm. is just incredible, right? I'm just in awe 
of, you know, Bosnian people who just kind of like, they keep going, there's still so much beauty and they're still, it's like, they're not going to forget, but they're also, I sense like, and I think this is part of our culture is that we keep moving forward. We always keep moving forward, right? I think that with this denial, I think that makes it, okay, you know, like, we're not going to just be like, we're going to keep moving forward and you're going to deny that this actually happened, you know, so... Mm. Um, it, it's so, amazing. Yeah. Sorry, I'm so sorry uh-huh. to interrupt. Yeah. Because now I'm going to start teaching like this international relations human rights law class. And amazing. I was just thinking like, you know, don't despair because the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia is one of the most important courts of international law today. Mm-hmm. And it gives us a lot of precedent for international law. I'll give you one example. There's a decision mm-hmm. called the Tadic decision of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, in which for the first time in international law, rape can be considered an actus reus for uh, genocide. So so, so the the use of rape as a tool, as as an action, where you already have the evil intent Mm -hmm. of genocide, so there you go. Now we have wow. an attempt at genocide. So, you know, the former Yugoslavia, when I was in Serbia, dude, as late as 2006, 2007, 2009, you know, women would come up in the park and just be like, can I touch your hair? Like, this is how far removed wow. this part of the world is. You know what I mean? Like, literally, bro, people were coming up and they were just like, "Wow, what is that? You know? <laughs> wow. and, so it's, yeah. it's, it's now in this part of the world also, there is the kind of relationship between the church and the state, right? Like mm-hmm. when Vladimir Putin walks out, when Lukashenko, when, when any of these people, you see this thing that you know from the Muslim world where like the robes are like right there, like endorsing the, right. the actions of the state. Okay. And so that causes like a further level of complexity in the formation of your own identity, right? It's like, mm-hmm. okay, now I'm seeing this, so I must be with this team and I must do with these people. Okay, so your kids roll up in here. These right. kids are like American to the core, yeah. Irvine, like, you know what I'm saying? Like they're yeah. in school, okay. Yeah. What's their, what, what is their unfolding through this process? Like I said, I think for Sarajevo, I think because we really wanted them to understand the history of the region. So I think they took it in as like a history lesson, you know, mm. and I think they were just mesmerized by this idea of like, you're walking through this old town and here's the church, right? Here's the mosque. It's mm. all within like one block of each other. I mean, it's all so, you know, together. And I think I think there was an appreciation. I do think that they they were able to kind of see Islam look different, you know, in this region and kind of see like, oh, this is coexistence in this interesting way with the complicated history, right? Um, so I, and it's, it's very, it's European, right? I mean, we're Eastern European, so there's a European essence to it. Um, you know, when we travel down to Montenegro, right, to see yeah. my family. Yeah. You know, where my family lives, you know, my parents were raised in a village, okay? Mm-hmm. So we actually went up to, you know, up, up the mountain, up to the village to go see, like, where their homes were, like, you know, where my dad's home is. There's no longer, you know, like a home there, but they still have property there. Where my mom's village is, it's, people are still living in that village. Like, you talk about, like, people who are, are really living a different experience, you know, like some, you know, it just feels like stopped in time. It's unreal. Especially yeah. for them. Like you taught them to drive on electric battery cars. Right. Right. And then they're going and they're just like, yeah, whoa, this is one generation removed. Right. Mm. And, and yet, I mean, they are, they are just amazed by the simplicity of life. Right. Like there's still cows in the, you know, in the, in the front yard and people still, you know, like know their neighbors. Right. Like everyone just walks down the street and says hi to each other. And, and, and like that simplicity of life, they, they also witness that. And I think that's what is so amazing. You know, I think um, even, even like I said, I hadn't been there in 20 years. So for me to kind of re-see um, this region, the first time I went, I only went to Montenegro. Um, for me, it was, it was just it, like, 
when I went at 20, right, which was right after college, it was this identity formation time. Like, who am I? Is the, are, are these my roots? What does this mean to me? Um, and now, you know, at 40 something, um, it's this, <laughs> yeah, um, it's, it's like, this is, these are my roots, right? Mm. And I, but I also am so American, right? And I'm mm. so okay with that. And it's, mm. and it's a beautiful thing. And I, but I also wanted the kids to uh, like, to know their grandparents in a deeper way, you know, because of the language barrier, I wanted them to like, you know, like really understand the context that their grandparents came from. Did you get a sense of their, a change in their perception? Yeah, I think it did. I do think it, it helped them kind of connect to their context a little bit. And um, I, I just, I, that was important for me. Like I, I wanted them to, and the, the other thing is I like my kids have been to so many different regions. We've been to really wealthy yeah. countries. We've been to really poor countries, right? So they've seen it all. So there's no surprise on their end anymore. They're always just in awe and oh, in oh, respect. Oh, that is so blast, so beautiful. Yeah. So it's not like, ew, this bathroom stinks. No. They're focused on what matters. Yes. And I think that's like, if there's anything that Omar and I could do was to have them have that kind of like respect for any space they go into and to really just take it in for what it is. And even if they don't understand the language or the culture, just to kind of be present, be present with wh whatever you're experiencing. Um, I just, I, so for me, it was kind of like a full circle. Like as my boys are older now, my oldest is 19, middle is 18. I know these family trips are not going to happen as often. So it was important for us to kind of like do this last trip, you know, before they get busy with their life. And it was such a beautiful experience. So when one, so this is Monita, it's just so beautiful, like so beautiful to see you unfold these ideas. When one listens to you now, one gets the sense that uh, you're someone that's comfortable in liminality you're comfortable in the in-betweenness of life stages. You're comfortable with each, and I know this kind of from our personal, you're comfortable with each of your children being different. You're comfortable with your husband be like your husband is the diametric opposite, opposite. of you, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Like he's, he's in the world. Okay. Yes. And, and you, you have always, Munira had this sense of relax, bro. It's going to be okay. Just keep like, okay. Today, we live in a moment where no matter your age, no matter your stage in life, you're tripping out. The world is unraveling. The pandemic is ruining people's sense of stability and regularity. And there is a cadre of folks who have kids that are, you know, last two years of high school, first two years of college. Mm -hmm. And as if that part of life is not hard enough, we now got like, you know, Trump and the pandemic and the craziness and you can go back. No, you can't go back. No, you got to get, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And when people, I think when people hear you talk about your kids going on this journey and their ability to be centered and appreciate things, they get the, they get the um, non A type Munira, the Munira that's lived and seen and pushed and thrived and sustained and seen the significance of your ancestors and the future. Okay. When they come to you and say, Munira, I don't know what the hell my kid is going to do for their future. They get the same Munira, but with all of that, like a type knowledge of like, here are your options. Here are how it goes. Here's what's probably going to happen. or what's probably not going to happen here. Okay. There is, there is now a world in which everyone is, you know, I have students whose parents told them take a year off. Just these people don't know what they're doing. You're going to take a year off. You're going to chill here and play video games. Or you're going to go right back to the university. When, okay. I have friends who are telling their kids, I'm not paying for a four year so that you can do it online. You need to go to a two year and you need to blah, blah, blah. Okay. Your conversation with a parent that is tripping out right now as the, like, I want to make this like an emergency <laughs> podcast. You know what I'm saying? Like back to school, dog. Um, where, where, where should people's minds be? Where should people's anxieties be? Where should people's hopes be? Mm. So, yeah, let me start with, you know, something my dad 
raised me with, right? There's this saying that we have, um, it's, uh, the saying is sis nizuve, which essentially literally means grit your teeth, you know, like grit your teeth. But what that essentially means is be brave, right? Be brave and move forward in everything that you do. And uh, honestly, that's always been the, you know, guiding principle is that there are going to be difficult things that come in our pathway. There, you know, we're living in a difficult time. And I think the resilience, right? People think either I have it or I don't have it, but that's not how it works, right? Mm, mm, mm. The process of what we're going through is building those muscles of resilience. Um, and I think the uncomfortableness that we're feeling and the anxiety that we're feeling, um, instead of running away from that and trying to, you know, just pull the covers and be like, oh, it's gonna get better. It's gonna, it's gonna go away, right? Like people who are kind of like in denial or in false optimism, right? It doesn't help, right? The ones that, you know, and I said this to my students back in March, April, because, you know, I work with a lot of high school students and I love working with this age. I just, mm. it just brings me so much joy and, and that can be a whole other topic. But I feel like young people do seek direction, you know, are, are seeking that kind of temperature from their parents and from their teachers and their professors. Like, is it going to be okay, right? Like, you've lived a little bit longer than me, right? Is it going to be okay, you know? Mm -hmm. And we can still be very honest that we don't know what the future holds, but we can lean into what we know about ourselves and how we've dealt with other difficulties in our life and how that's going to carry us through this difficulty. Mm -hmm. um, so many parents, you know, it's funny because I do feel like with young people, you can, you can say that to them, you can reassure them and they can move forward it's the parents ahmed who mm -hmm. really maybe the anxiety we've we've known too much or we're, we're anxious about our own life we're the ones who are imposing that on our young people we're the ones who are like no this is a decision this is the right thing for you versus actually checking in with our young people and going what do you want to do how do you want to move forward with this right mm -hmm. this is you know especially if you're going to college like this is a pivotal moments in your but life. Dude, the amount of self-confidence that it requires for somebody to trust their young person is, is I don't know, like, what's that? Where does but that that's the from? journey. I, like, so, I mean, at the core of parenting, right? Like, this is what parents don't realize that those, you know, first 18, 20 years, it is a slow letting go process, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're not moving in the slow letting go process in those 18 years, it feels very abrupt when they go to college. Mm. But it shouldn't be that. It should have been something that you're building all along, and, you know, when they're seven and 10 and 13 and 15. And so when you get to 18, there is a relationship that's built that you can have that conversation and that confidence. I mean, that for me has been the ultimate goal, right? Mm these kids need to adult, right? These young people need to have self-confidence outside of me and my opinions. Um, and so that, you know, I remind parents, you know, with parenting is that parenting is about our self-growth. It's really about our learning to let go and our dealing with our stuff that gets triggered with our kids, right? Mm. And if we don't have self-confidence or if we're struggling with anxiety or different things, we're not dealing with our own stuff because honestly, those kids are, are just receivers of whatever's going on with us. Mm. And I think that, you know, the phases of parenting, there are, and I remember like when my kids were around, you know, seven or eight and that, that moment of, I have to let go, right? And it's small letting go. And then I remember at like, you know, 12, 13, oh, there's another, like, there's almost these phases that if you're not paying attention, you're just kind of bypassing them and thinking, no, 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 they're still kids. No, 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 they don't know what they want. Mm. They, no, I have to make the decision for them. Hmm. Versus if you are trusting the process and you're really building this relationship with your kids, you do get to 18, right? And you do get to 19 and you do have conversations that, lets them make decisions that make sense for them, even if they're not exactly what you want, you have faith, right? You have faith that this is their journey and that you've given all the wisdom and parenting and everything you've done. And they know that they can, can come back to you so that they can move forward and make mistakes and learn from them. And that's life. And I think that's, you know, the paradigm of how we influence these kids or parent these kids, I think that's sometimes what's missing for a lot of parents because when they don't have control, they don't know what to do. 
how do you get at, you know, the number one theme I, I hear from people who have younger children, like, you know, four, five, six, seven is, I'm just trying to learn how to get out of their way. Like I can already, I'm too big, I'm too much in their space. Like I'm trying to learn how to get out of the way. And, you know, I am a believer, Whoa! and many people disagree with me that some cultures are better at getting out of the way than other cultures. Some cultures sure. are more patriarchal. They're more kind of all up in your sauce. They're more, and, and other cultures are not. How, how can an adult convince them? Like, it's the same problem with all the other topics. Like, how can we get someone to believe in the untested feasibility of what's possible for their kids over the known quantity of minimal knowledge that they have in their minds? Wow. Like, how do you preach hope? I mean, we have to live hope. I mean, um, oh, yes, yes. <sighs> Yes. We do. I, the th see, the thing is, I, I like what you said, this idea of getting out of their way. When they're younger, you need more guardrails, okay? Like you need more direction. Kids need stability. They need to know what is, right? So that when they're naturally growing and developing and having new ideas, there's space for that. And that's the part where you have, as a parent, have to kind of move with, you know, like when my kids were little, I was, I was very strict with them, but not from a sense of, authority and control, but from structure, they need structure. And you know, my husband's an educator, like we understand how, what, how children function, they, that gives them security and safety. So you need to create safety and security for kids when they're younger so that they can then grow and start having ideas and start making decisions as they get older. But if you keep trying to, but if you keep trying to force that at the next stage, no. then we're regressing now. Right. It doesn't mm. work that way. That's why there's these mm. stages that we have to let go. Right. So I can't be the same parent that I was to a five-year-old to a 15-year-old. I can't. I must grow with my kids. I must enter each phase with a new understanding and kind of letting go and letting go of like, you know, like these, these, you know, barriers or these kind of guardrails have to slowly extend so that they can figure out their way and they know where the boundaries are, but that they can do whatever they need to do to, you know, make decisions that make sense for them. When I had my first kid and I, you know, so we should say that we've known each other for a long time. I actually recited Quran yes. at your wedding. I know. Isn't that crazy? Still, I know. I it's, it's, it's you were a kid, crazy. Ahmed. You were, you were a and kid. You know what? And you know what, Monita? I say it. You are one of like a handful of people that stuck with me through all stages of growth, through all deformations of perception of self, through all the number of times I have laid someone out on the floor verbally in your living room over yeah. some like Islam, like, and I will always love you for it. And I'll always appreciate you for it. The first thing you told me when I had a kid is your, what your child does is not a reflection of you. It is not, that's not like, so like, you know, men will tell their daughter to, you know, six year old, close your legs on the couch, blah, blah, blah. blah. And really like, she's just watching TV, bro. Like you need to chill. Okay, H how do you do that? H how do you, how do you live with a with with a with a twenty year old, twenty five year old, eighteen year old, in public, and and have the confidence to understand that they are them and you are you? Well, because it doesn't start at twenty five. <laughs> I mean, it must start. Uh, it must start when they're five and six. You know that you have to challenge yourself because we will go into that place. Like, you know, like the Egyptians say, I, you know, like that's I, embarrassing, right? That's, you know, that's not part of our culture. Right. And you have to challenge the minute those ideas come in your head, like embarrassing for who, and why am I thinking this right now? And is this really necessary for this child's growth? Right. Um, it, it's, if it doesn't start at five and six, right. If you don't have those moments, you know, I mean, for me, my kids, put it in my face, right? I remember people always going like, you're okay with your son wearing yellow pants? So I'm like, 
why like it's his deal like i am not going to get involved in the choices he makes as far as like pants are not the end of the world he he feels confident in that isn't that what we're trying to raise confident kids right? no like literally right now you look like the prime minister or like the secretary of state and you have your oldest has got skinny tight yellow with the fro is coming out to like totally. right here and you're just like it's cool it's cool like he is him like that is who he is and i respect that and i love that about all of my boys even like you said my husband is very different than me i respect that i love i don't want people who are like me and i want everyone to grow into their beauty right and like mm. each one of them are so unique and such interesting human beings and i love just learning about them and 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 you know seeing how they think and i've always had this thing where i say I'm allowed to change my mind and you're allowed to change your mind, right? So that they're never mm. feeling like they're in a box. You want to wear yellow pants this year and next year. And then you go, you know what? No, I want to do this. Awesome. Like that's part of the growth process. That and means you don't it's working. To, yeah. You don't have to be in a certain box and have to do things a certain way. But I've, I've, you know, I think for me, that exterior stuff, I've, I've never, put value in that. Like mm. I have always wanted space for them to feel comfortable to be who they are and to dress how they want to dress and to have ideas that they want to have. And I want to engage them. I've never felt threatened by the choices that they make. Mm. I will, you know, advise. I mean, that's the part as a parent to advise, like, this is my perspective or this is how I see it. Let's engage in conversation on that. And there's many times that I've learned really interesting things, right? I've Oh, I didn't think I didn't see it that way. But you know, like, the end the end goal of that conversation is not for them to agree with you. No, because I know like it has to be honest to God, not the end it, goal. Uh, yes. And that's where I say to parents, if you are not curious, if you're not approaching your kids with curiosity, they can read your BS immediately. Like they mm. know if you're if you're just trying to manipulate their decision, they know, right? Mm. But if you're really curious about what they're thinking or why they're making a decision and you want to engage in that, you can have really interesting conversations and it doesn't mean you're going to get what you want. And that's the hardest part. Many, many parents want to get what they want. They want things to go a certain way mm. and it's, you, you have to trust the process. Mm. You have to, I mean, that confidence, I believe, honestly, for me, I'm like, isn't this Islam? This is what Islam teaches you, mm. right? Have faith, mm. like lean into the fact that you do not have control over these kids. Like mm. God gave them to you as a gift and you're supposed to kind of like water, you know, the, those flowers and let them grow. Like you have to believe that if you don't believe that, then you think you're the one who's like imparting everything on them. And you're the way the end result is your fault. And you have to separate that. Like that's where you're able to separate that. Mm. They dress this way. They are this way. It's not me. I'm doing my part as a parent. And I've said this repeatedly to my kids where I said, I have a responsibility to God in what I do, right? Mm -hmm. who, who you become and what that looks like, that's on you, right? That's not mm -hmm. me. I own the, the my part, but I'm not owning your part too. Mm -hmm. And I think when you, mm -hmm. we as parents mm -hmm. can do that, you you Oh my God, that. talk about like the mental health benefits of approaching life like that. Like it's not, it's not about guilt. It's not about whose fault it is because you're not banking yourself into this child right. as though they're a vessel. Right. You are trying to like, you're, there's engine and clean water and power and whatever. And then you just, you let it go. Yes. I just killed. Yes. I think that was, you know what? I can't let it go. I'm sorry. Wait, wait, wait. That was Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So we can't okay. just, <laughs> we, we can't, I can't just like let her sit yeah. on the floor. Um, okay. Can I take you to the next step, which is yeah. we are now in a world where, you know, you and I grew up in a world where you get a job and you get a master's degree and then you uh -huh. get in, then you get the manager, assistant manager, manager, super duper manager, la 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 la, vice president. And then your parents feel like, you know, you're a success. Okay. <laughs> now we're in a world where all of that, you, some of us have always been saying that that's bullshit, but hey, it's okay. We can all come to it together now. All of that is a bunch of nonsense. Okay. So. How do I, as a community leader or parent or friend of a parent, how can we build an environment where, where all options are respected again, right? Like if, I ha if I'm a JD PhD and my son wants to be the dopest mechanic that ever came, right. Right. Um, I know for sure that shit's not going to fly one generation ago. 
So how do we come to a place where um, life choices and career choices among our young people are not a source of stigma, but a source of like recognizing the beauty of our diversity? Oh, yeah, that's for immigrant parents is really difficult, right? And I work with, you know, a lot of you know, international students and immigrant parents who have a narrow definition of success. And I'm just going to say, just for the record, these are people from South Asia, Southeast yeah. Asia, from from yeah. from the, from the Arab world. All yeah. you're not talking all about over. a specific demographic. No, yeah. no, yeah. Go ahead. Um, so, like, it's universal. I guess that's that's what I mean. It's like this this you know um, narrow def- definition of success is very universal, and it, I understand where it comes from, right? If you're economically you know trying to give the next generation a you know leg up. Of course, you're going to approach, you know, college with what's the ROI on that, you know, and I, you know, I need an investment, you know, something needs to come out of this. You can't just go be a liberal arts major, right? There isn't value in that culturally. Mm -hmm. Um, And yet I feel that, like you said, opening or widening the space of maybe this kid is a brilliant artist or a brilliant mechanic or has ability that, I believe if we push our kids to be the best at whatever they're good at or that they love, Mm. that excellence will manifest into something even bigger than, you know, oh, he's just a mechanic. I believe that. And I feel like, you know, I've, with my own children, I have always told them like, whatever you do, there's no limits to what you want to do. Whatever you do, my only ask is that you do it with excellence. Mm. Do it with excellence be the best at whatever you want to do. And I think if we approach all professions and all careers with that, I think there is value in the contributions that our young people can make beyond just lawyers and doctors and engineers to also, you know. So if you have, if let's say hypothetically, somebody has a middle child who's a little bit quieter than the others, you don't force him to go give the the khutbah or the whatever maybe they'll maybe they'll win filmmaker of the year uh because they chose they have they were blessed with a parent that lets them do what they're best at yeah and then then from that moment now we're flying right now we know we have a sense of like what success is and isn't right and and respecting who that kid is right like that kid isn't the loud one and the one who's going to want to be on the stage and he wants to be behind the camera. Right. And you go, okay, awesome. Do it. You know, like do it the way that makes sense for you. That's that trust also. Right. Because I mean, it's really funny because my, you know, my middle son, the filmmaker, he will say like, mom, you know, like my Arab friends, you know, parents are very much like you can't go to film school. Right. They think like, you know, all my friends are like, you have the most amazing parents that you're so (laughs) open-minded to this. And I'm like, but this is your passion, like, and- And I your know, life. Yes, and your life, yeah, you're gonna make this work. I'm like, listen, I think what we as parents can do is we can say, listen, these, this is how much these jobs, you know, how much money you would make in this career. Does that work for you? You know, let them make that decision. Don't impose that, well, listen, can you really live on this much money? That's their decision and that's their life. I think we can offer the information. They need the information. That's a blind spot for many kids. But the ultimate decision of that works for me. I mean, I have some young people who will be like, I want a job where I can make, you know, 200K a year. That's what I want. That's like it. Their driving force is money. And we can, we can pass judgment on that, but you know what? Everybody's motivation for what they do is going to look different, right? There's, there's the motivation for money. Okay. But there's also people who are going to say, I'm motivated by doing good in the world, right? Mm. Or I'm motivated by creating. And you have to, if your child, if maybe you're motivated by money, but your child isn't, you got to let that go because that's that, you know, they heard the message. They know that's what motivates you, but at the same time, that doesn't motivate them. And you mm. need to accept that it doesn't and work with what motivates them. Mm. Um, and I think that's the piece that, you know, m- m- maybe a lot of, you know, immigrant parents were motivated by money, right. And success. Which and, makes and sense. Those, which makes sense. <laughs> There's no other yeah. way to get out of there. Yeah. And I say to my kids, I said, as second generation and third generation kids, you have more options, right? You have, yeah. you have social capital, you have, you know, financial backing already in place to make these decisions that many first generation parents couldn't. 
and even maybe some second generation parents had to, you know, navigate. So no, like, like if our parents, when they were young, saw your son in yellow pants, they would be like, oh, that guy's not gonna make it. Yeah. Right. right. Why? Wait, why is he not gonna make it? His haircut. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. But to your <laughs> kids, that's like crazy. Like, are you, are you insane? His haircut has nothing, right? Like that's the right. development that happened. Right. Okay, right. let me take you to a world where you don't know what's happening. You, Munira, are, sorry, white. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you are married to this like six, six, maybe six, five African Egyptian guy whose dad is known for having the palms of like a bear. Like these are big, loud, yeah. dude. Okay. Yeah. So now you have sons who have Afros and they grew up in a world of technology and a world of merit and a world of achievement. And then black lives matter happens, mm -hmm. which according to Malcolm Gladwell is, is you know, American civil rights movement. So now we have dad and mom and three guys, all of whom are seeing a changing narrative together. Right. Walk us a little bit through that, like a lot of dinner time conversation. I mean, I literally yesterday had a conversation with a university leader who's like, yeah, you know, my kids are back and, you know, dinner's hard, man. It's really you know, like when whereas whereas when they're at school, it's all good. Like we call we're best friend. But now that everybody's kind of here and we have to negotiate and the words that we use and I'm getting called like this and that at the dinner table. Right. How do we how do we walk through this moment as a family? Oh, such a big question, Ahmed. And it's so interesting that you say that, you know, um, we listened to your podcast, you know, the one that you did. I think it was right around the time of Black Lives Matter. I think white fragility, right? We were, yeah, yeah, the George Floyd one. Yes. So we were listening to that together. And um, just to, you know, like, have a conversation around it with you and the kids me and yeah that's and dope kids. all right just we were like okay let's you know i i was playing it i was in the kitchen i was playing it and you know i had it on blast and so they heard it in the other room and they were like oh is that Amma Ahmed?" i was like yeah and then we just kind of like listen to it yeah um yeah and they, they're familiar with the sound of screaming in their yeah. living room yeah there you go <laughs> um it was such an interesting conversation it you know you talk about growth and how we are constantly growing and constantly learning. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, we were, we were reflecting and talking about it and this is what blew my mind. My kid, my oldest kid looks over at me after the conversation, he goes, oh my God, mom, I just realized you're white. <laughs> oh my God, that is so- Like Ahmed, it was unreal. That is was, Ahmed, oh my God. Yeah. That's amazing. I just, like, yes, it was profound. <laughs> like we had such an interesting conversation. You, I realized you, like you. first stage revelation, you are. Yeah. And me and these dudes over here, we're something different. Yeah. But I'm yeah. not totally sure what that is yet either. Yeah, yeah, oh, exactly. I love it. Oh, I it love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. It was incredible. Yeah. And so what's also interesting is like you said, my oldest does have the Afro, right? He, you know, has olive skin. He looks, you know, um, this mix that people can't figure out. My middle son is definitely more white and knows he's passing white, knows that, and is very much aware of people don't get it. You know, like the same kind of reality I was mentioning to you of when I was growing up, right? Like, you know, I knew I was white, but I didn't feel white in the sense of, you know, being Eastern European, I still felt different. Yeah. I still felt like, but I'm not that, but I'm not that. I don't know what I am, you know, and that was the struggle I had growing up, right, as a white Muslim, especially before I started wearing hijab, because mm. I just passed off as white. Mm. And my internal reality was not that. And mm. I think that's part of the growth that happened in college, where I was like, I need to feel more familiar to myself and, mm. and, and, and reflect into the world what feels you know, familiar for me and, who, and my identity and who I am. Um, and so they're entering that phase, right? They're entering the, those early years of college. They're figuring out who they are and what that means. And what's interesting is they, they do and don't you know, connect to the Black Lives Matter movement, right? Like yeah. it's this interesting Makes struggle. Sense. Makes yeah. total sense. Because they were raised in a very, you know, like they're, you know, alhamdulillah, like the, the school that they're in is multicultural, right? It's not all white. Like when I went to high school, 
it was really all white, right? It was very few minorities at my school. They are, you know, they have Turks and Somalis and Nigerians and Asians and Koreans and, you know, like they just, they're used to that reality. For them, being different is cool. Right? And they've like lived them. and studied abroad. And they lived and studied abroad and actually felt that kind of nationalism in a different way, right? They felt that being the other, you know, not being like everybody else. Um, as well as they also moved to an international school where they met kids from Germany and, you know, um, you know, France and other countries. And I, so they had both of those experiences. And I think that's what makes them so flexible and not like tied to one identity at this point. They're, try, they're, they're trying to navigate like, who am I? They're very, very comfortable saying I'm American, right? And of course yeah. they are, yeah. they're very comfortable. But I think that uh, ethnicity part or the race part, I think they're still navigating that. And that's part of that conversation yeah. that we had, you know? Beautiful. and. It's incredible, and I like. Because you please yeah. go ahead, like you said. No, please. I said your podcast really was kind of that, you know, that thing that know. just sparked this conversation, and I and it was beautiful. Because in their own young lives, their identity, they've already seen the liquidity of it. Like I, yeah. when they were in the Arab world, they played. Maybe it was just your oldest played on a football team, right? Yeah, both of them did. Yeah. Okay, like American, Which was amazing. American, American fo football team. Right. So yeah with like 75% African American players, right? It was the most amazing experience. Like their coach was like from Atlanta, right? Like totally had this American, you know, like football experience that we would have never had here. So you Just jump, yeah. you jump. So like you come from a reality where yes. the segregation of economics and society, yes. et cetera, with there's, I mean, these kids are growing up in like, we won't say the name of the city, yes. but like a planned city, a city that was right. on a blueprint before it was right. on the ground here in Southern California. And then in the Arab Gulf, yes. they, they jump over that American apartheid, like segregation reality. And all of a sudden they got a coach from Atlanta yeah. Who's coaching them like he'd be coaching in Atlanta. Yeah. But then they come back home and at some point they realize, yeah, not nah, a football team. That's not me, dog. I'm going to go ahead and like, look, you know, look at some. So you see what I'm saying? Like, yes. If you can recognize the liquidity of your own identity at such a young age, then you can be free from, but not free by saying, oh, we're all the same. Right. Right. Not free by simplifying, but free by allowing the complexity to unpack. Yes, yes, yes. That is it. so dope. And, and that's what we wished for them, right? Like intentionally as parents, that's what we wanted for them always is to have that kind of understanding of you, doesn't, your identity doesn't have to be this one thing and to be comfortable in all circles, to be comfortable with all races, all faiths, all, you know, like rich and poor and have that experience to be able to navigate the world in any setting and to still be authentic to who you are. I, you know, Munira, it just blows my mind, dude, because I was thinking right now, like we have friends who live in quasi mansions and we have friends who live in two bedroom apartments and the 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 ability of all of these humans to see each other for who they are is and i'm not talking specifically about our friends is challenged by the current moment like we've been talking about our relationship with the people that live in our homes but you know like our friendships have really come under a lot of stress in the last mm -hmm. like you know year um yeah. you know you're kind of people that you love why did I say the mansions thing? Because, it, you know, we know we know people who are all about like buying the coolest thing. And we know people who are all about investing in their kids and community. And we know people who are all about both. And we've all come to be comfortable with that. But then now we're in a situation where it's like, but now that dude is kind of sounding a little Trumpish. And I don't know if I can like, what do you mean you only care about your taxes? There's people getting shot in the street. So our friendships are now coming under a newfound like pressure of like when this person was all about getting that money, I was okay with that. But now there are like new features to that or the other way around, right? Like you have surgeon friends who are like, yo, Ahmed needs to chill. 
uh, right? Because they just feel like that's not, okay. What is your guidance for us on how to engage like friendships, lateral in generation, intragenerational, like what do you think about when you see people you love tripping? (laughs) (laughs) I feel like it's still the same principle that even with my own kids, right? Like let people be like, they are on a journey. They Mm. are figuring stuff out in their own way. And this works for them now and let, let them be, and let us just kind of appreciate what it is. Mm. Um, I, I definitely, I think when, we see somebody who's a Trump supporter and it challenges what we believe, right? That's a, that's a hard thing to negotiate. But I also think like, what, why do we feel like we have to control other people? Why do we feel mm. like we have to, you know, like change people's mind? Like why? Like it doesn't bring us anything. It really doesn't. If you really kind of go big picture on that, it doesn't matter in the big picture. Folk, I, I've always... But why? Focused. What is the answer to that, Munira? Why do we try to control each other? Because I think it gives us... Like, if we can put people in boxes, we have more control over understanding the world and understanding maybe ourselves and how we're positioned to other people. Um, but I also think mm. it validates for us, if we believe something, it validates if everybody around us believes the same thing or if everybody around us, you know, is approaching things the same way. Um, I think that's why I have always, you know, like wear the yellow pants, even if nobody else wears the yellow pants, wear the yellow pants because it, it's what works for you. Right. And so always through even my parenting, I've always felt like, you know, the, the outcast, the one who's like, why is she doing it that way? Everybody else is doing it this way Mm. because it works for me. And I have enough self-confidence in what works for me and what I need right now and what you know how how our family's working that this is what we need and how what's working for us it doesn't have to look like other people and i remember even even within the unit i remember different points different stages of your life people would be like you know you did this for that one why didn't you do this for that one and you would be like because that's a different different. human (laughs) Human. like i don't understand like like you have always had this ability to not be tricked by the fact that we all live in the same house right It doesn't mean we're the same. Yes. And so if our homes are like that, Ahmed, how can we not extend that to our friendships? Mm. How can we not extend that same, like they are all different human beings and they all bring beauty to my life from different perspectives and different ways of being that I can respect and I can grow from. Mm. So I, I, again, it's a perspective, right? It's a way of seeing the world um, and it's not limiting. It's not limiting of myself and it's not limiting of the people that are in my life. Now, if there are toxic people in your life, well, you have every right to kind of go, that doesn't work for me. That that's just not healthy or it's not helping me grow. And I need to push that out a little bit and that's fine. But to feel like we need to influence and control, it's that manipulation, right? If you're trying to do that with your kids and you're trying to do that with your friends and you're trying to do that that with people at work, that you're putting a lot of power into your own hands that you really don't have. Like and you're really putting a have- lot of pressure on yourself that's going to crash pressure. hard Why? when you realize that you can't do that. Yes. I mean, Amazing. it's not, that, that's not the point of life. That's really not. The point of life is to constantly be growing and learning and experiencing and changing your mind when you need to. And it's okay. So I think <laughs> reducing that pressure, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think I'm always, you know, I'm always the optimist. And I, I always if I start feeling in my heart something like, oh, I'm struggling with this, or why is it this way? I will always ask myself, okay, what is the good in it? Or what is the strength in it? Or what is the positive in it? Like I always remind myself to reframe because if we go down that rabbit hole of always seeing the negative or always seeing something wrong, you're gonna live from that paradigm all the time with Mm -hmm. everyone that you engage. Mm -hmm. But if you can challenge that, like, yeah, this is challenging me right now, I don't like it, but what is, what is the positive in this? Or where is the beauty in this that I can identify? Because that will just shift your thinking a little bit and make you kind of open yourself up to a, a broader perspective on that person or that experience. And that's that self-growth that needs to be constantly happening, that self-reflection. Mm. Man, this is, man, 
in every way of life, there is a status for these people, like Munira. Um, you know, I'm not even going to give any titles because they would reduce the, the greatness of your contribution. Like, really, Munira, may God bless you for who you are and who you've become and, and, and who you make us um, all be, which is a lot better than we used to be. And um, thank you for your wisdom and, and thank you for holding our hand for an hour through the, the liminal state that we're all living in. Thank you. It's really honestly been an honor just to be in conversation with you. I always feel brighter, stronger after talking with you. And I um, I just, yeah, I, I'm, I'm honored. I'm absolutely honored that, you know, I hope some small thing that I said maybe touched somebody's heart and help them build resilience and have trust and faith and hope that things will be okay. They always are. They always are. So... There are no words that can be said after the words uh, of a sage. May Allah bless you. We thank you. We send you our love. And uh, my people, you've been in the study. We'll be right back.